a calm, slow sun looked down from tranquil heavens, a routed, sullen rear guard of retreat. The last rains had fled, murmuring across the woods, or failed a sibilant whisper mid the leaves, and the great blue enchantment of the sky recovered the deep rapture of its smile. Its mellow splendor, unstressed by storm-licked heats, found room for a luxury of warm, mild days. The night's gold treasure of autumnal moons came floating, shipped through ripples of fairy air, and Savitri's life was glad, fulfilled like Earth's. She had found herself. She knew her being's aim. Although her kingdom of marvelous change within remained unspoken in her secret breast, all that lived round her felt its magic charm. The trees' rustling voices told it to the winds. Flowers spoke in ardent hues and unknown joy. The birds' caroling became a canticle. The beasts forgot their strife and lived at ease. Absorbed in wide communion with the unseen, the mild ascetics of the wood received a sudden greatening of their lonely muse, this bright perfection of her inner state, poured overflowing into her outward scene, made beautiful, dull, common, natural things, an action wonderful and time divine. Even the smallest, meanest work became a sweet or glad and glorious sacrament, an offering to the self of the great world or a service to the one in each and all. A light invaded all from her being's light. Her heartbeats dance communicated bliss. Happiness grew happier, shared with her by her touch, and grief some solace found when she drew near. Above the cherished head of Satyavan, she saw not now fate's dark and lethal awe. A golden circle round a mystic sun disclosed to her newborn predicting sight the cyclic rondure of a sovereign life. In her vision, and deep etched veridical dreams in brief shiftings of the future's heavy screen. He lay not by a dolorous decree, a victim in the dismal entree of death, or born to blissful regions far from her, forgetting the sweetness of earth's warm delight forgetting the passionate oneness of love's clasp, absorbed in the self-wrapped immortal's bliss. Always he was with her, a living soul that met her eyes with close, enamored eyes, a living body near to her body's joy. But now, no longer in these great wild woods, in kinship with the days of bird and beast, and leveled to the bareness of earth's brown breast, but mid the thinking, high-built lives of men, in tapestry chambers and on crystal floors, in armored towns or garden pleasure walks, even in distance, Closer than her thoughts, body to body near, soul near to soul, moving as if by a common breath and will, 
they were tied in the single circling of their days together by love's unseen atmosphere inseparable like the earth and sky thus for a while she trod the golden path this was the sun before abysmal night once as she sat in deep felicitous muse still quivering from her lover's strong embrace and made her joy a bridge twixt earth and heaven an abyss yawned suddenly beneath her heart a vast and nameless fear dragged at her nerves as drags a wild beast its half slaughtered prey it seemed to have no den from which it sprang it was not hers but hid its hidden cause then rushing came its vast and fearful fount a formless dread with shapeless endless wings filling the universe with its dangerous breath a denser darkness than the night could bear enveloped the heavens and possessed the earth a rolling surge of silent death it came curving around the far edge of the quaking globe effacing heaven with its enormous stride it will to expunge the choked and anguished air and end the fable of the joy of life it seemed her very being to forbid abolishing all by which her nature lived and labored to blot out her body and soul a clutch of some half seen invisible an ocean of terror and of sovereign might a person and a black infinity it seemed to cry to her without thought or word the message of its dark eternity and the awful meaning of its silences out of some sullen monstrous vast arisen out of an abysmal deep of grief and fear imagine by some blind regardless self a consciousness of being without its joy empty of thought incapable of bliss that felt life blank and nowhere found a soul a voice to the dumb anguish of the heart conveyed a stark sense of unspoken words in her own depths she heard the unuttered thought that made unreal the world and all life meant who art thou who claimest thy crown of separate birth the illusion of thy soul's reality and personal godhead on an ignorant globe in the animal body of imperfect man hope not to be happy in a world of pain and dream not listening to the unspoken word and dazzled by the inexpressible ray transcending the mute superconscious realm to give a body to the unknowable or for a sanction of to thy heart's delight to burden with bliss the silent still supreme profaning its bare and formless sanctity or call into thy chamber the divine and sit with god tasting a human joy i have created all all i devour i am death and the dark terrible mother of life I am Kali black and naked in the world I am Maya 
and the universe is my cheat. I lay waste human happiness with my breath and slay the will to live, the joy to be, that all may pass back into nothingness and only abide the eternal and absolute. For only the blank eternal can be true. All else is shadow and flash in mind's bright glass. Mind, hollow mirror, in which ignorance sees a splendid figure of its own false self and dreams. It sees a glorious solid world. O soul, inventor of man's thoughts and hopes, thyself the invention of the moment stream, illusion center, O subtle apex point, at last know thyself from vain existence cease. A shadow of the negating absolute, the intolerant darkness travelled surging past and ebbed in her the formidable voice. It left behind her inner world laid waste, a barren silence weighed upon her heart. Her kingdom of delight was there no more. Only her soul remained, its empty stage, awaiting the unknown eternal will. Then from the heights a greater voice came down, the word that touches the heart and finds the soul, the voice of light after the voice of night. The cry of the abyss drew heaven's reply, a might of storm chased by the might of the sun. O soul, bear not thy kingdom to the foe, consent to hide thy royalty of bliss, lest time and fate find out its avenues and beat with thunderous knock upon thy gates. Hide while thou canst thy treasure of separate self behind the luminous rampart of thy depths, till of a vaster empire it grows part. But not for self alone the self is one. Content abide not with one conquered realm, Adventure all, to make the whole world thine, to break into greater kingdoms, turn thy force. Fear to be nothing, that thou mayest be all. Ascend to the emptiness of the Supreme, that all in thee may reach its absolute. Accept to be small and human on the earth, interrupting thy newborn divinity, that man may find his utter self in God. If for thy own sake only thou hast come, an immortal spirit into the mortal's world, to found thy luminous kingdom in God's dark, in the inconscience realm, one shining star, one door in the ignorance opened upon light. Why hadst thou any need to come at all? Thou hast come down into a struggling world to aid a blind and suffering mortal race, to open to light the eyes that could not see, to bring down bliss into the heart of grief, to make thy life a bridge twixt earth and heaven. If thou wouldst save the toiling universe, the vast universal suffering, feel as thine. Thou must bear the sorrow that thou claimest to heal. The day bringer must walk in darkest night. He who would save the world 
must share its pain. If he knows not grief, how shall he find grief's cure? If far he walks above mortality's head, how shall the mortal reach that too high path? If one of theirs they see scale heaven's peak, men then can hope to learn that titan climb. God must be born on earth and be as man. That man, being human, may grow even as God. He who would save the world must be one with the world. All suffering things contain in his heart space and bear the grief and joy of all that lives. His soul must be wider than the universe and feel eternity as its very stuff. Rejecting the moment's personality, know itself older than the birth of time, creation and incidence in its consciousness, Arcturus and Belfagor, grains of fire circling in a corner of its boundless self, the world's destruction, a small transient storm, in the calm infinity it has become. If thou wouldst a little loosen the vast chain, draw back from the world that the idea has made, thy mind's selection from the infinite, thy senses gloss on the infinitesimal's dance, then shalt thou know how the great bondage came. Banish all thought from thee and be God's void. Then shalt thou uncover the unknowable and the superconscient conscious grow on thy tops. Infinity's vision through thy gaze shall pierce. Thou shalt look into the eyes of the unknown. Find the hid truth in things seen null and false. Behind things known, discover mysteries real. Thou shalt be one with God's bare reality and the miraculous world he has become and the diviner miracle still to be. When nature, who is now unconscious God, translucent grows to the eternal's light, her seeing, his sight, her walk, his steps of power, and life is filled with a spiritual joy, and matter is the spirit's willing bride. Consent to be nothing and none, dissolve time's work, cast off thy mind, step back from form and name, annul thyself, that only God may be. Thus spoke the mighty and uplifting voice, and Savitri heard. She bowed her head and mused, plunging her deep regard into herself in her soul's privacy in the silent night. Aloof and standing back, detached and calm, a witness of the drama of herself, a student of her own interior scene, she watched the passion and the toil of life and heard in the crowded thoroughfares of mind the unceasing tread and passage of her thoughts. All she allowed to rise that chose to stir, calling, compelling naught, Forbidding naught, she left all to the process formed in time and the free initiative of nature's will. Thus, following the complex human play, she heard the prompter's voice behind the scenes, perceived the original libretto set and the organ theme of the composer force. 
All she beheld the surges from man's depths, the animal instincts prowling mid life's trees, the impulses that whisper to the heart, and passion's thunder chase sweeping the nerves. She saw the powers that stare from the abyss and the wordless light that liberates the soul. But most her gaze pursued the birth of thought. Affranchised from the look of surface mind, she paused not to survey the official case, the issue of forms from the office of the brain, its factory of thought sounds and soundless words and voices stored within, unheard by men, its mint and treasury of shining coin. These were but counters in mind's symbol game, a gramophone's disc a reproduction's film, a list of signs, a cipher and a code. In our unseen, subtle body, thought is born, or there it enters from the cosmic field. Oft from her soul stepped out a naked thought, luminous, with mystery lips and wonderful eyes or from her heart emerged some burning face and looked for life and love and passionate truth, aspired to heaven or embraced the world or led the fancy like a fleeting moon across the dull sky of man's common days amidst the doubtful certitudes of earth's law to the celestial beauty of faith gave form, as if a flower prince in a dingy room laughed in a golden vase, one living rose. A thaumaturgist sat in her heart's deep, compelled the forward stride, the upward look, till wonder leaped into the illumined breast and life grew marvelous with transfiguring hope. A seeing will pondered between the brows. Thoughts, glistening angels, stood behind the brain in flashing armor, folding hands of prayer, and poured heaven's rays into the earthly form. Imaginations flamed up from her breast. Unearthly beauty, touches of surpassing joy and plans of miracle, dreams of delight around her navel lotus clustering close, her large sensations of the teeming worlds streamed their dumb movements of the unformed idea. Invading the small sensitive flower of the throat, they brought their mute, unuttered resonances to kindle the figures of a heavenly speech. Below, desires formed their wordless wish, and longings of physical sweetness and ecstasy translated into the accents of a cry, their grasp on objects and their clasp on souls. Her body's thoughts climbed from her conscious limbs and carried their yearnings to its mystic crown where nature's murmurs meet the ineffable. But for the mortal, Prisoned in outward mind, all must present their passports at its door. Disguised, they must don the official cap and mask, or pass as manufacturers of the brain, unknown their secret truth and hidden source. Only to the inner mind they speak direct, 
put on a body and assume a voice, their passage seen, their message heard and known, their birthplace and their natal mark revealed and stand confessed to an immortal sight. Our nature's messengers to the witness soul, impenetrable, withheld from mortal sense, the inner chambers of the spirit's house disclose to her their happenings and their guests. Eyes look through crevices in the invisible wall and through the secret of unseen doors there came into mind's little frontal room thoughts that enlarged our limited human range, lifted the ideals half quenched or sinking torch or peered through the finite at the infinite. A sight opened upon the invisible and sensed the shapes that mortal eyes see not, the sounds that mortal listening cannot hear, the blissful sweetness of the intangible touch. The objects that to us are empty air, are there the stuff of daily experience and the common pabulum of sense and thought. The beings of the subtle realms appeared and scenes concealed behind our earthly sea. She saw the life of remote continents and distance deafened not to voices far. She felt the movements crossing unknown minds. The past events occurred before her eyes. The great world's thoughts were part of her own thought. The feelings, dumb forever and unshared. The ideas that never found an utterance. The dim subconscious incoherent hints laid bare a meaning, twisted, deep and strange. The bizarre secret of their fumbling speech, their links with underlying reality. The unseen grew visible and audible. Thoughts leaped down from a superconscious field like eagles swooping from a viewless peak. Thoughts gleamed up from the screen subliminal depths like golden fishes from a hidden sea. This world is a vast, unbroken totality. A deep solidarity joins its contrary powers. God's summits look back on the mute abyss. So man, evolving to divinest heights, colloques still with the animal and the jinn. The human godhead with stargazer eyes, live still in one house with the primal beast. The high meets the low, all is a single plan. So she beheld the many births of thought, if births can be of what eternal is. For the eternal's powers are like himself, Timeless in the timeless, in time ever born. This too she saw, that all in outer mind is made, not born, a product perishable, forged in the body's factory by earth force. This mind is a dynamic small machine, producing ceaselessly till it wears out with raw material drawn from the outside world, the pattern sketched out by an artist god. 
Often our thoughts are finished cosmic wares, admitted by a silent office gate and passed through the subconscious galleries, then issued in time's mark as private make. For now they bear the living person's stamp. A trick, a special hue, claims them as his own. All else is nature's craft, and this too hers. Our tasks are given. We are but instruments. Nothing is all our own that we create. The power that acts in us is not our force. The genius too receives from some high fount concealed in a supernal secrecy the work that gives him an immortal name. The word, the form, the charm, the glory and grace are mission sparks from a stupendous fire. A sample from the laboratory of God, of which he holds the patent upon earth, comes to him wrapped in golden coverings. He listens for inspiration's postman knock and takes delivery of the priceless gift, a little spoilt by the receiver mind or mixed with the manufacture of his brain. When least defaced, then is it most divine. Although his ego claims the world for its use, man is a dynamo for the cosmic work. Nature does most in him, God the high rest. Only his soul's acceptance is his own. This independent, once a power supreme, self-born before the universe was made, accepting cosmos, binds himself nature's self till he becomes her freedman or God's slave. This is the appearance in our mortal front. Our greater truth of being lies behind. Our consciousness is cosmic and immense. But only when we break through matter's wall in that spiritual vastness can we stand, where we can live the master of our world. And mind is only a means and body a tool. For above the birth of body and of thought, our spirit's truth lives in the naked self and from that height, unbound, surveys the world. Out of the mind she rose to escape its law, that it might sleep in some deep shadow of self or fall silent in the silence of the unseen. High she attained and stood from nature free and saw creation's life from far above. Thence upon all she laid her sovereign will to dedicate it to God's timeless calm. Then all grew tranquil in her being space. Only sometimes small thoughts arose and fell like quiet waves upon a silent sea or ripples passing over a lonely pool when a stray stone disturbs its dreaming rest. Yet the mind's factory had ceased to work. There was no sound of the dynamo's throb there came no call from the still fields of life. Then even those stirrings rose in her no more. Her mind now seemed like a vast empty room, 
or like a peaceful landscape without sound. This men call quietude and prize as peace. But to her deeper sight, all yet was there, effervescing like a chaos under a lid. Feelings and thoughts cried out for word and act, but found no response in the silenced brain. All was suppressed, but nothing yet expanded. At every moment might explosion come. Then this too paused. The body seemed a stone. All now was wide, mighty vacancy, but still excluded from eternity's hush. For still was far the repose of the absolute and the ocean silence of infinity. Even now some thoughts could cross her solitude. These surge not from the depths nor from within, cast up from formlessness to seek a form, spoke not the body's need, nor voiced life's call. These seemed not born nor made in human time. Children of cosmic nature from a far world, ideas, shapes, in complete armor of words, posted like travelers in an alien space. Out of some far expanse they seemed to come, as if carried on vast wings like large white sails, and with easy excess reached the inner ear as though they used a natural privilege right to the high royal entries of the soul. As yet their path lay deep concealed in light. Then looking to know whence the intruders came, she saw a spiritual immensity pervading and encompassing the world space as ether our transparent, tangible air, and through it, sailing tranquilly, a thought. As smoothly glides a ship nearing its port, in ignorant of embargo and blockade, confident of entrance and the visa seal, it came to the silent city of the brain, towards its accustomed and expectant key, and but met a barring will, a blow of force, and sank, vanishing in the immensity. After a long vacant pause, another appeared, and others, one by one, suddenly emerged, Minds unexpected visitors from the unseen, like far off sails upon a lonely sea. But soon that commerce failed, none reached mine's coast. Then all grew still, nothing moved any more. Immobile, self wrapped, timeless, solitary. A silent spirit pervaded silent space. In that absolute stillness, bare and formidable, there was glimpsed an all negating void supreme that claimed its mystic nihil sovereign right to cancel nature and deny the soul. Even the nude sense of self grew pale and thin, impersonal, signless, featureless, void of forms, a blank pure consciousness 
had replaced the mind. Her spirit seemed the substance of a name, the world a pictured symbol drawn on self, a dream of images, a dream of sounds, built up the semblance of a universe or lent to spirit the appearance of a world. This was self-seeing in that intolerant hush, no notion and no concept could take shape. There was no sense to frame the figure of things. A sheer self-sight was there. No thought arose. Emotion slept deep down in the still heart or lay buried in a cemetery of peace. All feelings seem quiescent, calm or dead, as if the heartstrings rent could work no more, and joy and grief could never rise again. The heart beat on with an unconscious rhythm, but no response came from it and no cry. Vain was the provocation of events. Nothing within answered an outside touch. No nerve was stirred and no reaction rose. Yet still her body saw and moved and spoke. It understood without the aid of thought. It said whatever needed to be said. It did whatever needed to be done. There was no person there behind the act, no mind that chose or passed the fitting word. All wrought like an unerring, apt machine. As if continuing old habitual turns and pushed by an old unexhausted force, the engine did the work for which it was made. Her consciousness looked on and took no part. All it upheld in nothing had a share. There was no strong initiator will, an incoherence crossing a firm void slipped into an order of related chance. A pure perception was the only power that stood behind her action and her sight. If that retired, all objects would be extinct. Her private universe would cease to be the house she had built with bricks of thought and sense in the beginning after the birth of space. This scene was identical with the scene. It knew without knowledge all that could be known. It saw impartially the world go by, but in the same supine unmoving glass saw too its abysmal unreality. It watched the figure of the cosmic game, but the thought and inner life in forms seemed dead, abolished by her own collapse of thought. A hollow physical shell persisted still. All seemed a brilliant shadow of itself, a cosmic film of scenes and images. The enduring mass and outline of the hills was a design sketched on a silent mind and held to a tremulous false solidity by constant beats of visionary sight. The forest with its emerald multitudes clothed with its show of hues, 
vague empty space, a painting's colors hiding a surface void that flickered upon this illusion's edge. The blue heavens, an illusion of the eyes, roofed in the mind's illusion of a world. The men who walked be beneath an unreal sky seemed mobile puppets out of cardboard cut and pushed by unseen hands across the soil or moving pictures upon fancy's film. There was no soul within, no power of life. The brain's vibrations that appear like thought, the nerves' brief answer to each contact's knock, the heart's quiverings felt as joy and grief and love were twitchings of the body, their seeming self, that body forged from atoms and from gas, a manufactured lie of Maya's make, its life a dream seen by the sleeping boy. The animals lone or trooping through the glades fled like a passing vision of beauty and grace imagined by some all-creating eye. Yet something was there behind the fading scene. Wherever she turned, at whatsoever she looked, it was perceived, yet hid from mind and sight. The one only real shut itself from space and stood aloof from the idea of time. Its truth escaped from shape and line and view. All else grew unsubstantial, self annulled This only everlasting seemed and true, yet nowhere dwelt. It was outside the hours. This only could justify the labor of sight, but sight could not define for it a form. This only could appease the unsatisfied ear, but hearing listened in vain for a missing sound. This answered not the sense, called not to mind. It met her as the uncaught, inaudible voice that speaks forever from the unknowable. It met her like an omnipresent point, pure of dimensions, unfixed, invisible, the single oneness of its multiplied beat accentuating its soul eternity. It faced her as some vast north immensity, an endless no to all that seems to be, an endless yes to things ever unconceived and all that is unimagined and unthought, an eternal zero or untotaled aught, a spaceless and a placeless infinite. Yet eternity and infinity seemed but words, vainly affixed by mind's incompetence to its stupendous lone reality. This world is but a spark burst from its light, all moments flashes from its timelessness, all objects glimmerings of the bodiless that disappear from mind when that is seen. It held, as if a shield before its face, a consciousness that saw without a seer, the truth where knowledge 
is not nor knower nor known. The love enamored of its own delight in which the lover is not nor the beloved bringing their personal passion into the vast. The force omnipotent in quietude, the bliss that none can ever hope to taste. It cancelled the convincing cheat of self. A truth in nothingness was its mighty clue. If all existence could renounce to being and being take refuge in non-being's arms and non-being could strike out its ciphered round, some luster of that reality might appear. A formless liberation came on her. Once sepulchred alive, in brain and flesh, she had risen up from body, mind and life. She was no more a person in a world. She had escaped into infinity. What once had been herself had disappeared. There was no frame of things, no figure of soul. A refugee from the domain of sense, evading the necessity of thought, delivered from knowledge and from ignorance, and rescued by the true and the untrue, she shared the superconscious high retreat beyond the self-born word, the nude idea. The first bare solid ground of consciousness. Beings were not there. Existence had no place. There was no temptation of the joy to be. Unutterably effaced. No one and now. A vanishing vestige like a violet trace a faint record merely of a self now past, she was a point in the unknowable. Only some last annulment now remained, annihilations, vague, indefinable step. A memory of being still was there and kept her separate from nothingness. She was in that, but still became not that. This shadow of herself, so close to naught, could be again self's point d'appui to live, return out of the inconceivable and be what some mysterious vast might choose. Even as the unknowable decreed, she might be naught, or new become the all, or if the omnipotent nihil took a shape, emerge as someone and redeem the world. Even she might learn what the mystic cipher held, this seeming exit or closed end of all could be a blind, tenebrous passage, screened from sight, her state, the eclipsing shell of a darkened sun on its secret way to the ineffable. Even now, her splendid being might flame back out of the silence and the nullity, a gleaming portion of the all-wonderful, a power of some self-affirming absolute, a shining mirror of the eternal truth, to show to the one in all its manifest face, to the souls of men their deep identity. Or she might wake into God's quietude, beyond the cosmic day and cosmic night, 
and rest appeased in his white eternity. But this was now unreal or remote or covered in the mystic formless blank. In infinite nothingness was the ultimate sign or else the real was the unknowable. And an a lonely absolute negated all, it effaced the ignorant world from its solitude and drowned the soul in its everlasting peace. 